Ready? Play. Welcome back to Painting Lines. Last week, we had a great conversation with Ivan Yutsik, uh, the CEO and founder of Recruited. And he talked to us about the platform that they're building over there and how they're helping kids play college tennis. Super interesting episode. 100%. Yeah. If you uh, are looking to play tennis in college, hop on Recruited. Yeah, check that out. But uh, this week, we'll be recapping Turin, where Yannick absolutely cleaned up. He finished the year-end number one and won the tournament which is not an easy thing to do. Only a few players have done it in the last 20 years. And most recently last year, Djokovic did it 2023. And then before that, 2012, 2014 and 2015. Then we had Murray do it back in 2016. And then Roger back in the day, 04, 06 and 07. And then Hewitt, 01, 02. And then throwing Gustavo Cuerta in 2000. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I guess it kind of coincides with just the fact of how dominant the big three were where it's like they can uh, get the year end number one. It's already wrapped up by the time they get to the year end finals. Cause like guys like Zverev and Sitsipas winning it. It's like, yeah, we, we knew they weren't going to be the number one guy in the world. Right. Exactly. And I feel like this is a true passing of the guard now, you know, like Djokovic likely will never be number one again. So there's just no chance that he can even win the year end finals or be number one. And he was last year, and officially that big three era is coming to a close. Just another piece of evidence that's like closing the chapter. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny how how like uh, completely the door closed at the end of twenty twenty three. It was like one of Djokovic's greatest seasons. He wins three Grand Slams. Uh, he does all this stuff. Year end number one wins the year end finals, and then next year it's like complete shut off. No titles. Mm -hmm. other than the Olympics and like complete changing uh, over just honestly a couple months. Yeah. Yeah. Was that a season on our draft episode? Djokovic 2023. I don't know if it was taken, but it was definitely one we were considering for sure. Well, speaking on that, if you could go back to the draft board, uh, the the one that we had a few episodes or a few months ago and kind of repick, where would you take this season? Because in my personal opinion, this is up there as like, one of the greatest seasons of all time. I mean, it definitely would be in like the consideration of uh, if, if you wanted to take it, like I would have had it on my draft board somewhere. Would I have ended up taking it in the draft? I don't think I would have taken it over most of the big threes, best seasons. Uh, I think maybe it could have take gone in like a really late round, like one of the last, last picks because it's going to be mm-hmm. behind all the three slam seasons obviously it's behind three rod slam? lavers four slam you think it's above a, a season that well, where i'm just won saying three slams maybe like a year in finals instead of a slam i don't think if so. you win three grand slams but no year in finals and you're not number one i don't think there's really a year where someone won three grand slams and wasn't <laughs> the number true, one player true, in the world that's true that's um, true I think maybe I could have taken over like Federer 2017 where he mm. wasn't the year end number one. Uh, but I think the storyline, honestly, in that one is is more interesting to me where he was on the comeback. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is all with a with a doping allegation or a positive test that's he's just tried to that he's had to deal with yeah. legally and stuff. And 100 percent. I mean, you also could maybe have taken over Murray 2016 mm. because uh, obviously that Murray only won. Uh, one slam that year but yeah even then i think that one was also had a cool story because it was coming off of maybe the great greatest season of all time which is djokovic 2015 and then murray comes out and is able to overcome him the very next year yeah crazy all right you want to hop into it yeah sounds good so uh let's just jump right into it with the group stage so honestly the whole thing kind of kicked off with a surprise first day Fritz beating Medvedev did not see this one coming, but when you look at it kind of in hindsight, it's not as surprising because you look at Medvedev, you're like, okay, he just hasn't been as not dominant because he wasn't like the number one guy in the world, but he seemed like he had a pretty strong hold of like, okay, I may not be able to beat Alcaraz or Sinner, but everybody else, I have a pretty solid chance of beating. And now he comes in against Fritz and kind of loses his mind in that match uh, mm-hmm. after getting unlucky. And it's just like, okay, these people can hang in rallies with him now. And 
I don't know what he's going to do to kind of reestablish himself if he wants to get back to maybe winning slams. Yeah. Well, think of it like this. The reason why Medvedev is so good is because of his consistency, right? Like the way he plays tennis, it's not like everyone's talking about his Alcaraz like shots or his center power uh, forehands. He's a consistent player. And I think he's been around on tour for a while now. And I think players are just starting to figure out like how to beat him at his own game. So I don't think he does anything like spectacular. He's just so good because he's so consistent. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I would say beating him at his own game because I think it is, I agree that it is his game is figured out kind of, mm-hmm. but it's more, it's more like they know the counter to it rather than like, I don't right. know if they're trying to out consistency him, but they're like, okay, I know that I just need to push for being a little bit more aggressive in certain scenarios. Mm-hmm. And those are going to turn out to be the key points in the end. Yeah. And I think that's why he does so well against everyone else, except the top, top players, like everyone yeah. outside the top five, he can hang with, but the players that are top five, they don't make as many errors as other players. And that game style just doesn't really compliment them. Yeah. And when they go for those aggressive shots, mm-hmm. they're much they more make likely them. to make them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, uh, Next day, uh, we had another big shock, which was Rude upsetting Alcaraz. I mean, obviously, there are some excuses for Alcaraz. He says he was ill. He had the whole uh, situation with that. Uh, yeah, did you see his nose strip? Yeah, he committed <laughs> to that. He was like, this is my look for this whole yeah. year in finals. Yeah, the um, pink one. I like that. Yeah, exactly. He could have gone with like the skin-colored one, but mm-hmm. he went for the pink one just to stand out, I guess. Um, but yeah, it honestly seems like Alcaraz struggles a little bit just to stay healthy. Like he, he has so many issues where he'll lose matches and he's like, yeah, my knee was hurting. My arm was hurting all these things. And you're like, you need to be able to stay healthy and be at the top of the game. If you're going to be competing for like a title of one of the greatest of all time. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes with maturing because i think a lot of great players start off when they're young it's like oh wow there's an immense amount of talent they're winning they're maybe not staying healthy and then once you get more established in your career then you start to build up a team and i think you can start hiring on like better physios and more people that are like their life their career is like making you better yeah so i just think like once he's older then He'll start having more attention and, you know, like Djokovic, paying more attention to his diet, his flexibility, everything. I think Alcaraz is going to have to start focusing on that as well as the tennis, where it's like not just tennis anymore. 100%. In, in like to give examples from other sports, like I, I saw something talking about Derek Henry spends like $500,000. He's a, <laughs> for people that don't know, he's a the running back for the uh, Baltimore Ravens, spends like $500,000 a year just to, investing into his body to keep him healthy same thing with lebron lebron spends like a million dollars a year to keep his body healthy just so he can continue to perform at that peak level yeah and those guys you mentioned are old by any sports standards like especially running back football what is Derek? like almost 30 i think he's over 30 i think he's like 33 yeah Yeah, see that's crazy yeah running back you really have that really (laughs) short timeline it's like yeah once you get up to like 29 they're like yeah you're pretty much done yeah, so I think we'll start to see that here in the next couple of years. Kind of like what's happened with Center. I feel like Center was going through the same thing, and he's gotten a little better at it. Yeah. Remember the cramping? Yeah, 100%. And he added Djokovic's guys. He did, exactly. He knows what it takes. Yeah, uh, but I mean, another couple of reasons this was such a shocking defeat for Alcaraz is just like, A, we talked about how Rude hates the indoor hard court. Like you mentioned, yeah. I think, a couple of weeks ago that he said it was his least favorite surface to play on. Yeah, he said it on a podcast. Yeah, so he's just – he hates indoor hard courts. So it's shocking that he would have one of his biggest results of the year uh, on an indoor hard court. And secondly, because of just their recent performances, I know that these performances have been on indoor hard courts, but Rude hasn't really done anything super impressive the last few tournaments. And then you look at Alcaraz, Alcaraz – has had some massive results in like the Asian swing and the end of the year. So you look at those two, it's kind of a dichotomy here between these two guys. And the fact that Rude ended up on top is pretty shocking. Yeah. Maybe Rude hit his wall earlier in the year than Alcaraz did. And is like now kind of recovering. Whereas Alcaraz is just kind of done for the year. Like he's worn out, he's hurt, he's tired. He needs a rest. Well, I mean, it feels like Rude kind of his whole season is just the clay season. It's yeah. like he plays all out until 
the end of May. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he's like, well, no one really expects anything from me from the rest of the year. Like he's going <laughs> to continue to try to win, but yeah. he feels like there's no expectations on him because we know, honestly, we've seen what he's done. Mm -hmm. Well, remember we were talking about this. If the year in finals, if that tournament happened to be on clay, do you think he could possibly win it? You think he's beating Alcaraz, Vera, even center on clay? You know I mean? That's just like a fun thought, thought provoking question. Yeah. Like, like we talked about this, uh, yesterday and it's i think it would have been a completely different scenario especially with the, how the groups were set out mm -hmm. like you have alcaraz Zverev, and rude all in one group and uh rublev in that group too who is underrated on clay has two masters 1000s mm -hmm. on clay and then in the other group you don't really have a standout clay guy sinner is the best player in the world but he he's not a standout clay player mm -hmm. you have fritz who's an american known to not be <laughs> great on clay medvedev very vocal about how he how he hates clay deminar a guy with no massive results on clay yeah so it's like it would be a one group <laughs> wow great clay guys and one group with four not so great clay guys yeah probably not the best final there huh yeah it, it probably would have ended up being like I, whoever came out of the the group of death there probably winning. Actually, you never know though, because because Sinner probably would dominate his group, and he's still competitive on clay. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, it just goes to show. I think Alcaraz is he's not as formidable as people think. Like he's prone to bad losses. Yeah, he's, he, he's human. I think, yeah, I think it's the the second part of that speaks to me more in terms of he's prone to like underperforming where. As Sinner, you look at him and you're like, okay, he can, he, you, it feels like he rarely, at least this whole year, he mm -hmm. rarely underperformed in matches. Yeah. His losses were all to Alcaraz almost. Yeah. I mean, he had, yeah. He went <laughs> 70 and six, I want to say. Uh -huh. Three crazy. losses to Alcaraz. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the next two days of the tournament, Tuesday and Wednesday, honestly, just went pretty much as expected. Uh, I mean, Rudin Zverev, very high quality match. But it really just seemed like uh, Zverev was just painting the lines when he needed to. Like, mm. he was just too good in certain points, and Rude didn't do quite enough. Yeah, pun intended there. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. I wasn't going to say no pun intended because <laughs> I definitely intended the pun. Yeah, um, no, I, I love the aggressiveness, Zverev, because sometimes he's known to kind of hold back, too, and especially against a player like Rude who, you know, sits there behind the baseline, so... Good for Zverev. Yeah, and I mean, I'll talk on that a little bit later, but yeah, Zverev definitely in some of his other matches could have benefited by being a bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. And then Medvedev, just another loss to Sinner. So he actually ended up 5-1 and one this year against Sinner. Just complete one-way traffic. Uh, they actually were the two guys like in Sinner's schedule they played the most this year. Six, six <laughs> matchups. I think the next closest was Fritz and Sinner with three. So... It, honestly crazy to play one guy that many times in one year and for it to be this one side it just feels bad for Medvedev oh I know and then you have Rude on the other hand who's played center like three times before this yeah he played like <laughs> once this year and it was just yeah. in this tournament yeah I think last time was like 2021 exactly just avoids him back but, before he was like the Yannick center too yeah but I mean I then, think he still beat him the other aspect is is this is like the reason that happens is because Medvedev is performing up to a point in most of these tournaments. That's true. Like they're meeting in the quarters. Yeah, they're meeting in the quarters. They're meeting in the semis, mm -hmm. stuff like that. They meet in the Australian Open final. Like these matchups aren't happening in like really early rounds. Rude probably is able to avoid him because <laughs> he's already out of the tournament. <laughs> oh, that's cold. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, to wrap up the, the, the group stage, Zverev beating Alcaraz, honestly, mm. just cemented his number two ranking there. Like, we were like, oh, it's kind of shocking that Zverev is ranked higher because he obviously Alcaraz has won two Grand Slams this year. Mm -hmm. But Zverev's consistency has put him in that spot. And then he says, yeah, no, I'm here for a reason because I'm actually able to beat the other guy. Yeah. And I can go right into this because this is going to be my match of the week. And mm -hmm. we're going to switch up the format a bit. So instead of waiting for the segment, I'm just going to go into it right now. 100%. All right, gear up because it was a crazy one. So first set was very tight. It ended up going to a very tense tiebreaker. Um, both players were holding serve. You know, Zverev's automatic when, he, when his serve is on. 
And then in the tiebreaker, Zverev ended up getting a mini break on Alcaraz first with a gorgeous passing shot. And then he pretty much looked in control from there. But then Alcaraz ended up giving him a little bit of a scare with his own mini break, also on a gorgeous passing shot. And this one, he went behind Zverev. So I feel like Zverev's passing shot was more of like an out physical where like you know where he's going and he just performed that much better than you. Whereas Alcaraz's was kind of like an outsmarting passing shot too, where like Zverev had it covered, but the shot may not have been as powerful, but he just kind of finessed it behind him. And I thought that was great when you get like a more of a mental win on the player. And then other than that, so Zverev still ended up winning the first set in the tiebreaker seven, five. And then he, um, once he won that set, he actually clinched his spot into the semifinals already. So like he kind of celebrated a bit as if he had won a match almost Mm. like put his hands up a little more than the normal celebration you would do Mm. after winning just the set. Yeah. But that makes sense. And then immediately broke him in the second set and then just held on from there. The la- In the last game of the of the second set, there was probably the point of the tournament. Like this rally was over 40 shots long and it was one of those tense exchanges. Like it wasn't just a boring back and forth. It was like players running across the court, um, beautiful shots, like with pace. And Zverev ended up finishing it off at the net. And you could not have crafted a better point. Like it was one where he looked in control the whole time and was just thinking four or five shots ahead. And then ultimately, um, you know, just kind of finished it out. And I feel like I hate the long points where someone just plays defense the whole time and then ends up winning the point, like someone like a Deminar. Whereas like Zverev (laughs) held on to this point, didn't let Alcaraz turn the defense into offense and um that was pretty much like the highlights of the match and all in all Zverev showed great variation in his game he even pulled out a serve and volley which we don't normally see from him it was actually pretty funny to see and just his ability to move he was moving very well against Alcaraz Alcaraz tra- kept trying to um, try him with the with the drop shot and then Zverev was chasing him down so he looked very athletic out there for his big frame and it was it was my match of the week yeah solid I mean uh, I think uh, going back to what you were talking about in the first set with the two different strategies for passing shots it kind of seems like a microcosm of their two games where mm. Zverev might do just like the higher percentage play like hey if i hit it this way it'll be 60 percent of the chance that i win whereas mm-hmm. alcaraz is like hey i might not actually have the better chance but because he doesn't expect it i'll be able to do this and that's kind of the more flashy way to play which mm-hmm. kind of fits with alcaraz's style yeah but yeah oh uh, yeah overall i think yeah just impressive by zverev to get it done here against a, a guy that while it, honestly it's not Alcaraz, I mean, it is Alcaraz's best year, right? I mean, mm. two grand slams. Two slams. It's just the fact that he isn't the number one because <laughs> he's behind center. So, yeah, impressive to beat a guy that uh, has played so well the whole year. Yeah, well, back to those passing shots too. I thought Zverev passed very well, and um, just on the on the flip side with Alcaraz. So Zverev's a six six frame, so it's hard to pass someone like that, like by creating angles. So yeah, you kind of need to outsmart them by like putting it where they're not even expecting it. Exactly. All right. Should we move on now? Yeah. So the last, uh, last match I want to talk about before we get into the semis was, uh, obviously rude holding on over Rublev, uh, close match, uh, but rude got it done. And honestly, like it's no small win for him in, against Rublev either. Like not to say Rublev is like beating Alcaraz, but you look at these two guys and you're like, okay, well, Rublev honestly may have been favored on an indoor hard court where Rude isn't as comfortable. In the end, Rude still gets it done. So props to him, but feels kind of bad for Rublev because he got no wins now in the last two ATV finals. But in the end, Rude just shock of the tourney. I honestly think he, I kind of expected him to have maybe the lowest level of performance uh, of any guy. And Mm -hmm. in the end, he's in the top four. Yeah, it's funny funny how it worked like that. This is the one that my dad sent me a Norwegian article as if I was going to read it, like as if I spoke Norwegian. And uh, they're just like talking because it is a big deal, man. Like how 
poorly he was playing before and then to have him make the semis here like it made national news in norway pretty big yeah but yeah let's jump into the, the semis here so first we had zvera versus fritz which was an excellent match uh it was my match of the week so i'll i'll, I'll break it down yeah, uh, give it to me in general so uh Tight first set, Zvera ended up just getting a break, carried it through. It was it was just good playing for both guys, very high level tennis. Honestly, second set very similar, but kind of on the other side. Zverev got the break and ended up holding it out. It it did seem like Fritz might be able to break back later on in that set. I think at five two or five three maybe, but in the end, Zverev uh, held on and and we went to a, a decider, which there weren't that many of in this tournament, but. The last set was a ton of tense games. Uh, Zverev, he uh, almost broke at 2-2. He actually led 40-love in this game, uh, or love 40 because Fritz was serving, but was up, had three break points, couldn't get it done. For At 4-3, or it's 3-4, it was 15-40 with Fritz having the chance to break, and he had ended up having three break chances in that game, couldn't convert him. So it, it was a lot of just guys having the chance to break and that serve coming up big for both guys. Similar thing, 5-5. Five, five. Bunch of deuces. Zverev gets two more chances to break. Doesn't get it done. And then in the end, Fritz gets it done in the breaker. And when you look at the stats for this, there were zero conversions on eight total break points in the final set. So both guys, three for Fritz, five for Zverev. Chances to break, which probably would have decided it based on how well both of them were serving. And... The fact that neither one could break probably was the the end of the road for Zverev there. Yeah, totally. And this I can see kind of turning into a rivalry because I would say these players have it's not a beef, but they have history because when they played at Wimbledon, remember um, Zverev made that comment about Fritz's girlfriend cheering and just not knowing tennis, and then Fritz kind of stayed out of it, but his girlfriend was very adamant on rooting against Zverev and saying this one's for all the girls out there, like this is for the ladies because it was right in the middle of his trial that was going on. So I feel like those two have kind of gone back and forth here. And then also in this match, the VAR drama, where you can now challenge plays or like call reviews. So Fritz had hit hit a nice drop shot, and Zverev came in and picked it up, and it was a put away for Fritz right at the net. But because the umpire said it double bounced, Zverev challenged it, and instead of just giving Fritz the point because it was pretty much won anyway, they had to replay it, That's which crazy. I think is such BS because it only penalizes Fritz. Like what yeah. they should have done is let the point play out and then say out or not out, but double bounce. Review if, review if it double bounced, right? Yeah, yeah, because that it just didn't seem fair to me. And if yeah. I was Zverev, I would have conceded the point. Yeah, right? maybe. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I just think it's uh. Yeah, that's definitely a weird one having the replay of the point, but it's mm-hmm. at least it's not as bad as that Borges versus Garen match. <laughs> yeah, I know, <laughs> right? But it's funny how you know everyone's talking about having to uh, speed up tennis because it's so slow, and then they just add in video <laughs> replay exactly, too, exactly, and they show a clip of Zverev sitting on like the edge of the thing, just waiting. Mm. Yeah, so great match overall, mm. and uh, an interesting one. Yeah, very. But yeah, I mean, like you said, lots of drama there with the uh, the matchup. I mean, you have the the, the Wimbledon matches. You have uh, the fact that Fritz beat him at the U.S. Open. And now you have this match where Fritz beats mm-hmm. him again at the uh, year end final. So, mm. but yeah, and then the other semifinal, honestly, not much to say. We had Sinner just clobbering rude where the two guys just seemed to be at a different level. I think it was one and two. So mm. completely just all everything for Sinner. So yeah. Not a good matchup for Rude, right? Yeah, exactly. Not a good matchup. We're just playing a player better than you. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Not much to say. Just I feel like this is a common theme with center, too. Like, it's not the worst thing to happen. You know, you get spanked by number one player in the world. Yeah. But anyway, on to the championship. Another match where not that much drama in it. Center beats Fritz. It was a relatively close match where Fritz had some chances to break, but in the end, it just felt like Sinner was just in the driver's seat the whole time. 6-4, six, 6-4, four, six, four, just pretty much what we expected. And yeah. uh, I, I did uh, do remember you you sent me that you made some bets on this match, right? Yeah, no, I, I had a couple bets. So you inspired me to look for the two and two, like, or 
first four games, the score be two to two. So I looked for that, got that, that one hit. And then the other one was the most random bet. It was for both sets to either be six, three or six, four and center wins them. I'm like, I could see that. Cause I don't think he'll dominate Fritz, but I think he'll like, you know, I don't think he'll go to seven, five. So yeah. Especially with how that solid uh, Fritz's serve has been. Yeah, I took that one. Once it hit the first set, I was like, okay, this one might actually go. Here we go. And then Fritz was kind of making me nervous here and there about like potentially breaking center, but then he couldn't. So that one held on too. So that was two good bets out here. Yeah, I got to look for those prop bets. Just just the way yeah. to beat the book. <laughs> yeah, I know. And center served very well too. Yeah, extremely it was, well. It was good to see. That about wraps it up for uh, the ATP year. I mean, final tournament. We still have some Davis Cup yet to come, but we'll be uh, doing some superlatives. We're giving some reflections and some projections as well. Uh, the next coming weeks, do you, if you guys uh, have an Id- any ideas about uh, what you want to hear us talk about reflecting on this year, drop some comments below. But for now, uh, you ready to hop into segments, Eric? Yeah, let's do it. Hey guys, before we jump in, we have some exciting news. We recently partnered with TruePro. They're a great place to buy strings, grips, and tennis apparel. Use discount code PAINTINGLINES, that's one word, for 20% off store-wide. You can find the link in our bio. All righty, what's new in tennis? What'd you see this week? So my what's new this week is Fritz surpassing $20 million in career earnings. He's had a great year financially, the best one he's had so far. And just an awesome year all around, too. He went from number 12 in the rankings to number four. He made a Grand Slam final. He made a year-end final. You know, these are positions that he put himself in where he could have been the first American to win since. You know, like, for example, in the slams, it was he could have been the first American since Roddick to win. Or, like, in this case, the year-end finals, he could have been the, the first American since Pete Sampras in 99 to win a final. So... I feel like when you're doing that, you're doing a good job in yeah. in your respective sport. It's like, yeah, setting yourself up for success, kind of. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like you're being compared to legends. Exactly. Exactly. Like even other if you're American not tennis players, yeah. yeah. You're top American. Yeah. You know? And you're, you're like, even if you're not necessarily like getting it over that last little bit, it's like people mm-hmm. are talking about, okay, mm-hmm. Fritz came so close now. When was the last guy we had that did this? So pretty impressive but i think also think it's funny kind of talking about the career earnings like mm-hmm. it's pretty crazy that someone like that's ended the year as number four player in the world in their career has made 20 million and mm-hmm. you look at just three ranking spots up you have <laughs> sinner who made like probably almost 20 million in one year yeah yeah it is crazy when it rains it pours man exactly exactly All right, how about you what did you see this week uh, mine is kind of just a review, but it's very relevant right now is just the fact that Nadal's final matches are coming up. We got the Davis Cup final starting in two days. So tune in. It's going to be uh, maybe your last chance to see uh, the uh, Spanish Bowl play. So, wow, will be uh, will be cool to see, but also sad. I was going to say, I'm not really expecting a whole lot from it. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see him. He could. Here's the thing. <laughs> he could still win a match. You think about how we did earlier in the year, like. He won a couple matches in those those tournaments. Yeah, and I think he. Was, I saw some practice clips. He's looking pretty sharp out there. Exactly, exactly. So you never know. You never yeah, know. you never know. I guess. Yeah. So for better of the week, uh, kind of going to skip it this week. Uh, obviously, this was the last tournament of the year for the uh, the ATP Tour. So going to take a, a little bit of a break off of that. Um, yeah. No random prop bets. Italy plus one seventy five. Italy plus one seventy five. Davis Cup back to back. I'm throwing it out there. Could be, could be. Right. I mean, or you could go Spain. Spain. Yeah, you could go. I don't know what their their. I think Spain are, was two twenty five. Yeah. So, what is that? Three to one. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and then uh, match of the week. We already talked about that. I mean, mm-hmm. Fritz and Zverev. Like I said, great match. Possibly a great rivalry in the future. And then uh, for you, Zverev Alcaraz. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh. Good all around finals. You know, I thought it was like it had the perfect amount of shock upsets and then also just dominant play by center 100 percent. i would have liked to see alcaraz versus center though that would yeah be that's true probably that's more true. exciting than <laughs> rude getting just blown out yeah i know all right and that's the show if you're not already subscribed go ahead and hit that subscribe button you can find us on instagram tiktok youtube at painting lines podcast 
feel free to shoot us a DM or email us any questions or thoughts at paintinglinespodcast at gmail.com.